Um, my name is Ed Wall, uh, Kingston University. Um, I, I, I'm really interested in, in sort of the different perspectives that uh, everyone's pres presented. Um, and you know, Tom mentioned the sort of you know, whether it's a, a positive thing to be separating out. I suppose what I think he meant was the sort of the economic from social, environmental, and other sort of components or perspectives of of landscape. And the thing I struggle with is in promoting uh, landscape or built environment, uh, public realm as a um, by using economic analysis is do we distract ourselves um, during the de design process? Um, and forget about uh, social and environmental equality and just focus on the profits um, and economic benefit we can give to our commercial clients. Thanks. Um, my name is George Bull, I'm the editor of the journal. Um, I guess I've got kind of two points perhaps in focusing around how perhaps you move landscape architecture up the food chain. Um, it strikes me that there's two potential layers to this. And one is perhaps, do you pick very specific battles? Um, for example, with local authorities, I recently sat in on a round table about where the cuts are being made. Do you perhaps target landscape as a means to improving a local authority's risk agenda, for example? The government's mandatory uh, bill that flood um, flood insurance, for example, will be available to all communities comes to an end this year, and there's a question about whether or not that will be renewed. Could you, for example, could landscape be promoted then as another way in which local authorities can retain risk or invest in preventing the risk of, of flood? There, is there an angle there which you can market it? And the other layer, I think, is, is something that's much more ethereal perhaps but it's ultimately about making landscape architecture cool and that's you know whether we like it or not architecture has been sexy it's been political it might be on the way out but where's where's landscape architecture there how do we I'm really interested in how we might get to that kind of position especially in terms of attracting more young people to the profession Hello, Helen Allen, um, unemployed graduate landscape architect, one of many, I think. Um, I was just wondering about whether we should be a little bit more hard-hitting in our approach. Um, I've been involved in the disability field for the past 15 years, and the conversations we're having here tonight and many other landscape events I've been to have been very similar to those in conversations about 15 years ago about how do we make developers take people seriously, particularly those who can't get the front door because there's a flight of steps. Um, and unfortunately, developers are not going to do it at the kindness of their heart, whether it's plants or people. And I really think we need to be get, going down the plan route and actually unfortunately forcing developers to do it. You know, some local authorities do have percentages where you have to have green space per head and you've got to have place space for developments over a certain number of people and, and, and units. Should we be actually saying to look, we need to actually be saying, you know, we need green space per head, we should be having edible space per head. You know, this is really such a big issue in future for about, you know, how we actually survive in our cities. And it's not about pretty gardens, as we all know. So I just think we, maybe we should be actually working more closely with the RTPI and, and actually really going down the planning route, because unfortunately developers aren't going to do it out of the goodness of their hearts, particularly now, and with, with, with all the, you know, the caps going with the social housing, the government's investment in social housing, you know, they're finding it hard enough to deliver the buildings, let alone the landscape. Okay, one last point, then we'll come to the table. Hi, I'm Alison King, working at Land Use Consultants. Um, I'm just thinking about what's been being said up there, and I was thinking wondering if there's a way that we can try to take advantage of the um, e economic situation we're in, in that sort of necessity is the mother of invention idea where, you know, when people are desperate, they're more likely to take a leap of faith. So if we're talking about trying to convince people who at fatter times may not be easily convinced, if we can kind of get into these, these roundtable meetings and start whispers, uh, you know, and, and picking up on the point of being able to come up with options that are, we know are good, but also will save them money. They might, they might be prepared to take lateral jumps and leaps of faith, at, 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 in, and maybe we should be pushing that, and I wondered if you thought that was feasible. Thank you. Um, I, I 
would like to take another round from the floor, so we'll take very brief responses from the table to any of those questions. Please. Well, br briefly, I think um, we need to get more into policy. Because if we don't set policy, we're not going to. I think what you said was absolutely right. We have actually got to set policy because without that bigger picture, um, we're just decorating around the edges. And I'm fed up with decorating other people's projects. Um, I, I want to get in there and, and get the meat, really. I would like to respond to Ed's question about. Uh, does sort of concentrating on the economics destroy the social aspects of the landscape? And I think that was what you're saying. Um, I, I feel exactly the opposite, actually. I think it's, um, there's a sort of ecological model here about um, the most dynamic bits of ecosystems are what's happening at the edge. And uh, I think that relationship between economy and space and, I mean, it's a obviously well-known uh, urban design thinking about how that works. Um, can actually make a space that works better socially as well as creates economic outcomes to those landscapes as well. And um, seeing landscape in isolation from economy, I think actually waters things down in terms of uh, um, the potential benefits and also the, the um, vibrancy of what, what, what can be achieved. Um, the other question was, I, I, I'm intrigued about this idea of edible space per head through uh, the planning process. I mean, in Sheffield at the moment, the, the demand for allotment space, I believe, has never been higher. And there's a huge boom in the food growing mo movement at the moment. We have a, uh, a project called the Abundance Project, which is quite exciting, where they crop all the uh, fruit crop of the city in the autumn now through a voluntary program, and they make all juice and take it into schools and teach children that you know you can make juice out of the apple crop of the city, and they, it's all uh, done through the Sure Start Project, if that still exists. Um, <laughs> Uh, and there's some, some great stuff going on, a whole organisation called Grow Sheffield, the whole thing of food growing in the city is quite on the boil at the moment. So I think that idea of using the planning process to uh, uh, force um, more edible growing space is great. Yep. Yeah, I would agree with you about the economic and social. I mean, I'm sorry, economic is not financial. Economic is the totality of what we're talking about here and obviously social benefits will generate outcomes which are desirable. Secondly, I fully agree that we're going to be very short term. We have to worry about identifiable things from 10 years, 20 years and we must make sure that those are included. Otherwise, we're going to go back to the wrong sort of heating, you know, really basic things going wrong in that context. But I think you're pie in the sky in terms of where we are in terms of pl either planning or local government finance. If you can't reduce the cost, if you can't restrict the planning constraints, you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, and on that moment. On that same theme, I, I agree. We, we do need the help of the planners, um, whether we like it or not. It, it does help in, in the contaminated land remediation business. They only stop digging holes in the ground and, and putting it in landfill because of the landfill tax. It, it does help. And I think, but I think if we can work with the, R, the likes, the likes of the, the RTPI, uh, again, we need to get them to work with us.